What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always Headphones Neil with a lot of different reviews to go through for this particular week. So I'm going to jump right into it but I'm also going to try and keep the episode as concise as possible so I might get on a rant or whatever but I'm going to aim to keep the episode to the usual length but um, aside from this rambling I figure it's, I'm going to try to make it or it may, just because of the amount of content, it might be a little bit longer than usual. Also because I'm making up for um, not having a proper episode last week for Thanksgiving here in the United States. So with that being said, um, to start it off, I wanted to get the Fear the Walking Dead update out of the way. Now that we're done with the season and the series, um, I want to say that in general, they closed it out okay mostly just because the second the last few episodes except for the finale were a lot of just running back and forth to figure out who padre was and determine what the future of padre was going to be what everyone's going to be up to and then with the final episode we had um madison kind of doing what she did in season in one of the earlier seasons with the water cooler when she originally lost um her kids um, basically doing that again and then learning, for example, that we thought that um, Alicia had a daughter, but she actually didn't. Uh, but then we also had the return of Alicia. Apparently she's been alive. She's been staying out of sight and hidden because the idea of her is stronger than her um, actually being alive because it has been creating a distraction. So Madison and her decide that she, Madison is going to do the same thing. So overall, that's why I said it was okay, because like the re reappearance of Alicia was kind of a very big matter of convenience just to bring her back. I guess I was, by the end of the second to last episode, I was kind of calling it. And then over the course of the final episode, I'm like, okay, when do we get Alicia back? And sure enough, she comes walking in. So it was an okay thing. And then they did make the decision to go back to California, I guess, which for me... It was kind of one of those things where the show should have stayed ideally in California or I don't know this it feels like they every time that they could take the story forward they ended up going back and doubling back on the stories that they already told so um, for me it just became a matter of completing the series rather than actually enjoying it um, which brings me to my review of Stargate Atlantis so on one hand, I can now say that I've seen all of the Stargate properties, so all three films, SG-1, Atlantis, Universe, and Origins. To which I kind of want to say that while I would normally say that Universe is my uh, favorite of the spin-offs versus, like, Universe versus Atlantis, Atlantis felt like they were doing a repeat of what we saw in SG-1 with a lot of the story arcs of, like, the disease and the city and the race trying to do stuff, but not to quite the same extent. So it got to that point where the race story arc kind of felt played out. So even though they had, you know, we learn, you know, little bits and pieces of information of the race hierarchy, it wasn't near enough or near as enough as or complete as what we saw in Stargate SG-1 with the ghouls. So even though we started off with just Ra in the film and then Anubis for a couple of seasons, they expanded the um, ghoul to give them unique identities. So we saw, you know, Sokar in Hell and Hathor and Lord Yu and Anubis and all these different ghouls that had this power structure. So short of actually doing the same thing with the Wraith in Stargate Atlantis, it almost feels like they should have done that and created a full-on society and expanded on the Raid society um, rather than going down the road of just giving um, random Wraiths their individual names that Colonel Shepard was giving them. So even though that kind of worked with um, Colonel O'Neill and Stargate SG-1, they had the rest of the backstory of the ghoul to fall back on to help develop the story. So that's something I didn't quite see here with the Atlantis. 
The only thing that kind of got me intrigued and I wanted to see more of as well was like when we learned about that Wraith not only can take um, a person's life force but give it back and they only reserve that for people that they consider their brothers which are usually or you know family which are usually only other Wraiths so that's why I was kind of like okay that's pretty cool so it would have been nice to see even a lot more of that or have a entire season where it's just from the point of view of the Wraith or something but it kind of feels like they should have spent more time instead of just telling a random story about the Atlantis, the Wraith, and the Replicators, which would have been fine, but it kind of would have been nice to expand more since they had the opportunity in Atlantis to not worry about what's happening so much in SG-1 and develop a whole nother set of stories and stuff rather than kind of have a repeat of episodes in SG-1. So part of it too might have been just, you know, budgeting and um, focus on, you know, the stuff for Atlantis and they don't have as much of a budget as, as SG-1 or they don't have it anymore or whatever reason but still it's one of those things where they could have taken the story a lot further and move and introduce a whole bunch of new um like they tried to introduce societies and stuff like that and other cult people and culture with different humans and stuff but even those weren't taken as far as they should um as far as anything that's good of the show um i i will say the acting overall was good i did like all the characters and i did like that so it's not necessarily the actors or the acting it's just the stories that were kind of repetitive um and the biggest instance that i can give for that is um and great now i'm drawing a blank on that commander guy that always was catching shepherd uh colia that um that the interactions between him and Shepard were great and that society and all of the stuff that they went through that was um you know great and awesome I liked every time that happened but then there wasn't nearly enough of that but I did think that they were starting to have a good thing there where he made a, I think he made a deal with the Wraith or they captured a Wraith or something like that so I thought that might work as a good story arc but that didn't last as long as we thought so it's one of those things where they're still kind of copy SG-1 but not have that and kind of place those same stories in the Atlantis um, frame of mind. So overall not bad but I've I, I did want to set out to finish the show and I finally did so um, there's that. Um, now as far as some catch up stuff that I wanted to watch, um, I wanted to watch Die Hard again just because we're coming up on Christmas and it's kind of now an annual thing where we watch Die Hard every year, so rewatch that. It still holds up as a film. Um, have the whole thing with Yippie Kaye, um, his what he does, and like his wife um, realizing that um, Hans is just a bank th thief and all of that. Like the whole thing is good, so I like that. Same thing with the sequel. We ended up watching Die Hard two and three as well, so um, both of those definitely hold up nicely. And when you think about it now in retrospect, it's one of those things now where they kind of have a missed opportunity with the franchise where each one could have been the introduction of another Gruber brother that's pissed off at the death of the uh, last one and then after the second one, after the last two and so on, where they're pissed at John McClane for killing their, their brother and brothers. So the next Gruber brother tries to um, claim vengeance on um mclean so you can keep the same um they could theoretically have kept the same movie titles and do what they did in the third one where you where he's the where he um the older brother is taking vengeance for the younger one and the whole movie interacts so they could have should have done that with the second fourth and fifth ones and make it just another Gruber brother that's trying to have bigger and bigger schemes to take out john mclean and he ultimately wins so not to say that even for the fourth and fifth ones i enjoyed them personally but in retrospect they could have kept that story arc going um same thing with um reginald vel johnson the father from family matters it would have been nice to see him in all the movies instead of just the first two in various capacities they could even like just having him have a cameo um appearance like in the second film would have been nice to have him in all of them and then the on have an ongoing bit with um mclean's wife and the reporter guy so um um so i like that they continued it from the first to the second but it would have been nice to have it in each one where the second one he happens to be on the plane the third one 
um, he happens to be the report, one of the reporters on the scene, and um, it happens to be the school where McLean's kids are coming out for school, and his wife, John's wife, comes to pick him up. In the fourth one, when he goes home to try and reconcile with his daughter, and he meets with his wife, something like that. The last one, I don't know, maybe she bails John and his son out of jail or something like that, or meets them at the airport on the way back because she saw them on the news. So, and then the reporter happens to be um, the what's his name that she hates and has a restraining order against. So, something like that. It would have been nice to have the, all those kinds of bits go on through all the films, but. Um, needless to say, like I said, the first three films definitely hold up. The fourth and fifth, I personally like. Um, just because for me they work, I know that they're not necessarily popular with everybody, but um, for me, I enjoyed them, so um, there's that. And now my last couple of reviews are going to deal directly with my Doom 3 gameplay. So I'm going to get that out of the way first. So I am continuing to play Doom 3. Um, I've gotten to the point where um, I've defeated the, I guess, the main um, mid-game boss, I guess, the, whatever that guardian thing is that's guarding the soul cube. So there's a special thing for Doom 3 called the soul cube, kind of like, well, I guess the BFG isn't necessarily a special thing for the first two games, but like for, I guess the, not the, I want to say gimmick, but that's going to sound worse than it is. So like for the first game, for Doom 1, the BFG was a big gun. For the second game, they introduced the super shotgun. For Doom 3, we have the soul cube. And the backstory for that is actually pretty cool in the game where there was a society, they were being run over by the demons of hell. So they developed this thing called a soul cube, in which they used on their own population. They put, they kill people five at a time to charge it up and they used it to take out the demons and push them back. And I thought that was a very cool story to the point where I was kind of hoping that they made, they would have made all of Doom 3 based around the story of the soul cube where they found it and by extrapolating from the um, story and the technology and um, what they learn about the Soul Cube is how they develop. Like I think they, the rest of the dig dealt with the development of the teleporter technology, but it would have been nice to expand all of UAC's development, um, knowledge and technology and development and all that based around all this and like tie it in all together and use the Soul Cube as that starting point. But regardless, they do have the one of the scenes or one of the levels later in the game where you do learn about all of that. You see that there was a figure that looks very much like the, the Doom guy. Um, so overall, it's turning out to the, the story actually worked out very well for that level. So um, the darkness and visuals aside, as far as how dark a lot of the levels are, that story made it very much worth it. So I actually can't wait to finish off the rest of the game. Um, as far as an early review of the game, I want to say that overall it's a decent game. It's not necessarily very Doom-like, except for the cutscenes where you do see um, Sergeant Kelly in the Doom guy-like uniform, your own Doom guy when he's walking into view, like the camera stops and the Doom guy keeps walking, and things like that, but Doom 3 feels more like a template to developed Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal as far as new visuals and weapons and gameplay and, and interaction and all that. Because jumping from Doom 2 to Doom 2016 could have been handled a lot worse. So for me, I actually am seeing the appeal of the game just the, mostly in that they needed to upgrade the visuals and abilities and what you could do with the Doom platform. And Doom 3 is that bridge to update a lot of the visuals and lightings and do what they can. So while we don't have things like the red, yellow, and blue keys, um, you do have a lot of scenes that are, you know, red-like. Or and so even like when the you have that um, the Doom guy having those visuals of hell's and hell and things like that, it turns red. So you have that tied in. A lot of the levels, especially like the Delta Center or Delta Labs and um, the Alpha Center or whatever it was called, all the buildings inside are very bluish. Um, as far as yellow goes, there's not too much yellow. So I want to say that you could say, you know, the lights are yellow or something like that. So you kind of have that subtle nod to it in a different way. And, you know, you have to do things like use 
the PDAs to unlock doors and get access, learn about stories and backstories. So even though you don't have, you know, end of episode um, cards to tell you what is happening with the story, by get, picking up different PDAs, you're learning about the story along the way. So I actually don't mind that too much. It actually gives more context as you're going for what's going on, what you need to do, where you need to go, and all of that different stuff. And the only thing that kind of sucks, at least for my amateur gameplay, is you're moving forward, you're fighting enemies, and you have to turn around and fight enemies behind you. But on the flip side, that actually works as a good way to... Um, expand on the story that um they can tell jump in any from anywhere they're um all the demons are teleporting in so the teleporting de everything can happen anywhere so uh rather than having the um the enemies already placed on the level they teleport in at various spots based on your location which is okay um i also like the individual teleporting so rather than the player and the um enemies using the teleporters the same we have the enemies teleporting in and then, you know, they um, build up the backstory of the teleporters that it's a UAC de developed technology based on what they found um, at the dig site on Mars. So overall, things like that work. So um, I'm in overall, I'm enjoying it. So um, if it was a game up until, you know, the teleporting level, it was just a generic like horror scary style kind of game but once they start adding in those various elements it actually gets to be a lot better to the point where that's why i kind of figured that they should have started introducing the soul cube story earlier on um whether it's through um betruger and, and i forget the marine's name already not sergeant kelly but the other one or they introduce that argument early on that they're talking about the soul cube and the progress isn't being made or up to the level and speed that they want and they talk about how it's very far advanced technology far beyond their abilities and it's going to take time and all that and even name drop the soul sphere you know name drop teleporters name drop the bfg and all that so you have something to look forward to as the reason why you're going through all of this rather than just following you know sergeant kelly's instructions having to get to various places and things like that and then for me like the downside mostly is having you know five levels related to alpha labs and another like five or six related to the delta labs so things like that could have been compressed a little bit they could have just made a you know a one episode game with you know make it 15 levels instead of the traditional 10 and make it a game that flows better because after you know three levels of alpha labs and same thing with the delta labs um it does get a little bit repetitive and then just mind numbing a little bit because you don't know what's gonna what you need to do what's the point of all this and so by the time you get to you know going to hell and coming back learning about the teleporters and the soul sphere and all that you're like yeah this is cool and interesting stuff so why is it why are we learning about it in like the last third of the game or the second half of the game when some of this could have been introduced earlier to give the game a point so Granted, also, this is, you know, like 20 years in retrospect, but now that I'm playing it, I'm seeing the potential of it. I mean, it feels, like I said, more of a um, template and platform in order to launch um, Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. So with that being said, since I've been playing the game and I um, just have been, you know, basically just playing through it, it finally hit me that... I think the reason that I'm liking the game more and more is that it's based on the film or the the Doom film is based on the game. So once you make that connection, you're like, oh, well, now I can see why, whether or not you like the game, you can see why Doom the film did how it did, mostly because, in my opinion, they were they built the movie out, out of probably the lesser of all the games where they could have built it off of, you know, Doom 1, even Doom 64. Um, not necessarily Doom 2, just because the icon of sin, well, just, I mean, in general, Doom has a lot of religious connotations with heaven and hell and demons and all that. Um, but with the icon of sin, it might have been one of those things where it's not that it can't be done, but, you know, it would not have gone over as well if they just, if they had stuck to, for example, the Doom 1, or film based on Doom 1, where you teleport in, you have to go through all the levels, you meet up with, you know, 
the Hell Knight and then um, the Cyber Demon and the Spider Mastermind and then make it a sci-fi horror game where um, hell, where it's a mishmash between hell and technology or even like take, combine elements of like Petruger doing from Doom 3 doing his experimentation and the Hell Knights are actual demons and they're protecting the technology of what the society behind the Soul Sphere created. And, um, you know, Betruger learns about all this, goes to hell, finishes the research, and that's what creates the Cyber Demon and the Spider Mastermind. So you have a movie where the Hell Knights are, you know, halfway through the movie as a mid-movie boss, and then um, Betruger, you know, makes it to the teleporter, flips the switch, and the Cyber Demon teleports into, you know, like the Nevada desert for Area 51, because that's where, a, you know, the a teleporter pad used to be, or um, something like that. So, you know, Carl uh, Urban and the Sarge have to go there and take him out. And then in order to close the portal, they have to go to hell and defeat the Spider Mastermind. Um, they could te theoretically have even split it up into two movies where keep the existing Doom 2016 movie the same, develop the Hell Knight as the main boss, but do what they did in Doom Annihilation, um, where they kind of leave it open-ended as far as what happened, where they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily able to close the portal um, because Hell is keeping it open. You have the Spider Mastermind on the Hell side, keeping the portal open to continue to send the forces of Hell. So in the second movie, and you can develop this technically into a, a trilogy of movies where in the second movie you have um, the Spider-Man mastermind keeping the doorway open. So now you have, like make the first movie about, for example, in, Del in Alpha Labs, um, go to the point up to the teleporters where the Hell Knights teleport in, you close a portal. Second movie is all about learning about what's going on at Delta Labs. Um, so, in, like in the first movie, you have you pick up all the weapons up to the plasma gun. In the second movie, same thing, you pick up all the weapons, but you learn about the BFG 9000. And, um, the, like I was saying, the cyber demon gets teleported in, but the, and he gets teleported into, you know, Area 51 or Las Vegas or something like that, some ra or a random city. And because the Earth, um, portals are not able to handle such a big massive transfer they explode so while the portal is closed on the earth side the hell side is still open um doom guy can defeat the cyber demon but because of the energy released by the cyber demon or something the portal is open there and the now you know carl urban because he's the only one who survived you know you can have sarge and the rest of the squad having fought against the cyber demon and died um, you have him jump through the portal, leave that as a cliffhanger, and in the third movie, have it deal with um, Hell Alone or um, take place again on Mars and, you know, go to Mars and then to Hell or something like that and make the final battle against the Spider Mastermind. So it kind of, because Doom 1 and 2 don't necessarily, they have the visuals and, you know, a basic story, it's easy to take some liberties. So for me, in retrospect, um, if maybe and then maybe this was their plan all along was to have that um, whole thing set up where um, they develop a trilogy of movies and because that's kind of for like the Doom twenty sixteen movie um, that's kind of why like it was not bad in my opinion not terrible but they were basing it off of the um, Doom three video game which was is a mo least Doom like movie so it's basically Doom in name only but. It feels like, and then when I get to the Doom Annihilation review, you'll know why I would prefer they had built it off that a little bit more, or why they did it better. But it feels like they needed to incorporate more of the original Doom elements into the movie to make it work, and it could have been more successful. Um, but so things for so the good things about Doom is like, for example, you have Reaver punching out a guy. Um, the invisible wall scene for the med bay felt like you were going into a secret room, so it was a little bit of a nod there. BFG didn't need to be in Bioforce Gun, which I'll get to more about that in my Doom Annihilation review. And the other thing too was why was it a blue bold instead of green? They could, maybe it was a whole green screen problem, but 
they didn't need to call it the BioForce gun or they didn't need to define it. They could have just said, we, we don't know what it is. We just call it the big effing gun. Um, they had a bathroom scene, which was nice versus like to tie that to Doom 3, which I didn't have a problem with. Um, the other problem I had was that you can have like a chainsaw zombie, but you don't have your imps throwing fireballs. So I wonder if that was like the Super Mario or no, um, Street Fighter problem where they have the visual but no special effects. So that was kind of weird. Like, okay, if I have, when I'm done with the movie and thinking about it, I realize that those were imps, but they don't throw fireballs. Like you have, you, they didn't have the defining thing of the imps. So that car, that part was hard. Um, the hand-to-hand -hand combat thing was kind of weird. That was a little bit too much, I thought. Um, mostly because, you I mean, you can punch out your enemies with the Berserk Pack. But they didn't really use a Berserk Pack, so I don't know why they didn't do any of that. So that's why one of those things where Doom, the movie, felt a lot like a horror... Just a random horror movie, because that's kind of what Doom 3, the video game, is for the most part until you get later in the game. So... For me personally, just like the video game, the Doom movie should have expanded on the Soul Cube story arc. They don't necessarily have to build it up, but they could have even just said there was an ancient, like they did, like there was an ancient culture technologically advanced fighting these demons. They helped us develop everything you see here, plus the plasma gun, BFG, and all that, and take it from there. Um, so that's where Doom Annihilation comes in. So while it's not a, a true sequel to the move to Doom One, it does um, take some of the same elements, but hashes out a lot of the problems that I have with it. So um, you have a lot better shots of the Moon and Mars versus the first game. So when you're when they're doing those panning in shots and the the base on the map for the briefing room, it looks a lot like the. Um, maps that you see at the end of each level when you're playing Doom 1 and 2. So I thought that was a nice touch. You And then you have things like the color cards are red, yellow, and blue. So they tied that into the movie. Um, you have one guy saying, oh, I'm, um, you have one guy saying, I'm your ultra nightmare. And you have another guy saying, I'm too young to die, which are related to the um, difficulty settings in game one and two so while it was a little bit cheesy i actually appreciated that so if you're a video game fan those um would stand out to you kind of along the lines from mortal Kombat of get over here or finish him and things like that um it was weird the one weird scene was they had a dead marine named william blatskovitz so if you don't know who that is that's the main character from the wolfenstein 3d game so um, that was more like of an Easter egg, just to you know have a head nod to that video game, kind of where Doom drew its inspiration from. Um, you have a, one of the main characters using the chainsaw herself, so that was um, good there. Um, you have a secret level in the movie, so um, that was a nice touch as far as a secret base having a secret level. So that's directly tied to Doom One and Two, where you if you leave the certain levels at a certain point you can get to a secret level so um there's so that's really the bulk of it i mean doom annihilation felt like while it was a, it's an unofficial movie and still based on doom 3 they spent a lot more time paying homage to the original doom video games especially to the point where you have imps throwing fireballs so even though the main boss is still i wish i couldn't tell who that boss was on mars i guess theoretically maybe a uh, guardian or another demon i was thinking that it might be like a hell knight or a baron of hell even though it's a different shape that's kind of what it felt like but it did focus a lot more on imps but the imps threw fireball so that for to me that stood out the most as um being true to the games and then you still have you know zombie human zombies which match was in doom 3 so um, Doom Annihilation felt like it was tying in the original elements of the first two Doom video games that people liked, put it into the story of Doom 3, and you get Doom Annihilation. So for me, if I was to recommend a, the movie, I would recommend that over the first one. Doom 1's credit is that um, Carl Urban definitely does look like Doom Guy, and um, The Rock definitely looks like The Sarge, so... Those were good casting calls, so if they were in the Doom Annihilation film, that would have solved that movie as far as casting, and they keep everything else the same, the CGI, the budget, and all that. 
but which I think may is potentially the problem with the Doom 2016 or the Doom film is that you have all you have three big names in Carl Urban, The Rock, and Rosamund Pike. Um, there are a few other people in there that are um, actors of note, like you've seen them before. So it feels like the casting budget was pretty high. They didn't have enough budget left over after that for the story. So they're like, let's just match the Doom story, the Doom 3 game story as best we can and cut out things that we don't need. So you take out the casting budget and you have a bunch of unknown actors. Then you can focus on the CGI and like the gameplay mechanics from the video games that translate into the films, which is why Doom Annihilation works better for me. Um, I think it's rated less than the Doom film, but in general, um, I want to say Doom Annihilation is probably the better film just because it pays more homage to the um, video games a lot more than the official um, film does. So. That's one of the things why I recommend that. Um, so I'm looking up the Rotten Tomato score right now. So the Doom film with Carl Urban and The Rock is 18% with the critics and 34% with the audience. Um, Doom Annihilation is 43% with the critics and 15% with the audience. So in net, they're about the same, I guess, depending on the direction. But I guess in this case, I'm siding with the critics that Doom Annihilation is the better film. I'm not saying it's a great film or anything like that. It still could have gone, gone a little bit further, like with the Hell Knights or the further bosses. But for me, it feels like they need, could have developed the Doom games as a trilogy of films and separated by boss fights. So for me personally, like follow Doom 1. Um, you know, make the Barons of Hell the first movie's boss, the Cyber Demon the second movie's boss, and the Spider Mastermind the third movie's boss and have them you know team up sg1 style with um the marines and then scientists have them discover the story progress through the story and ultimately get to the final boss by uncovering something they shouldn't have by developing something that unlocks their cage or something like that and take it from there so that's all for this particular episode that covers everything i've been watching so um i figure by the next episode i'm going to be done with the doom 3 video game so next week's um review for the game will include the final boss fight um i don't know what i want to say there's a cyber demon but i don't know who the end boss fight is going to be against so um by early next week i should be done with the game and then next week's episode will have the review of the game. Um, as far as media reviews, I just started watching Goodfellas because I realized I haven't seen that movie in full. I've seen bits and pieces of it, so I kind of know what happens in it, but I don't think I've seen it in, or I don't have a memory of seeing the movie in full, so I'll have a review of that next week. Um, Aqua Teen Hunger Force season 12, I think, has returned, so I've started watching that. Um, and then for next week or i think i previously mentioned i was going to start watching or finish watching the vikings but if i didn't that's the next thing to, next show to finish watching is Vikings. so after goodfellas i'm going to get to that i think i've seen a few episodes in season five so i'm kind of so i'm not sure where i left off in season five but um i'm starting from the beginning there so i can do a recap from there and move to the end of that show so as soon as I finish that, I'll have a full recap of that, but I'll probably do a weekly update depending on how many episodes I get through there. Um, so that's all that comes to mind at the moment. So if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or anything like that, links to the social media sites I'm on or on the um, website at headphonesneal.reviews, uh, gameplay videos and uh, podcast video versions of the um, podcast or up on the youtube channel at youtube.com slash patel n01 and if you of course if you want early access to the podcast um ad free versions a link to the video version as soon as it, as soon as it's up you can subscribe and support the show on patreon at patreon.com slash patel n01 um one last thing actually i just remembered is i don't know what my next video game play is going to be after doom 3 um, I was thinking about playing um, either Resurrection of Evil, the follow-up game to Doom 3, or um, there is a, I think there's a way to play um, 
uh, Duke Nukem 3D on your Android device, kind of along the lines of Delta Touch works for Doom. I think there's a Duke Nukem version of that as well. So I'm going to, so after I finish Doom 3, I'm going to give that a shot, see how it works. If it works great, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll start playing that, see how it goes. Um, if it doesn't work, then I'll play Resurrection of Evil. I think it's only like 10 or 12 um, levels, so either way it works out. Um, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, then you also saw that I uploaded um, a couple of videos for Knights of the Old Republic for my 2024 gameplay that I'm currently working on playing. It's mostly just because I want to try out the Brotherhood of Shadow um, add-on pack that someone created, so I will figure um, it's about time for another gameplay, so I'll play the game. It's integrated um, directly into Knights of the Old Republic, so I'll go through that gameplay once I guess you get through the Leviathan, then you can initiate that story arc, and then there's another whole bunch of um, gameplay that's available there. So my first um, thought was to play the Steam version and use my to use Steam Link to play with my Razer Kishi so I could install that mod. But the original, the Steam version of Kotor is not controller friendly. It's not updated to work that way like the Android version. So upon doing some more research, I found out that you can actually install Brotherhood of Shadow on your desktop computer via Steam and then copy those files directly over to your smartphone. So after about a couple of hours of copying, it's a really big file. I mean, it's only 600 and something megabytes, but there's like 6,500 files or something like that to copy or 6,000 files or something. So it takes a while, but I got it copied over. I, and I uploaded a quick video of the initiation of that particular story arc. I did use the developers, uh, save game to, um, get that started, but essentially my, the first gameplay, the first video in that playlist is um, the one where I saw I was testing how Steam Link and the Kishi work for KOTOR. Um, initial thoughts were it works, but the right joystick was too sensitive. Further testing was that it's not really going to work. It's not sensitive enough. So the second video, I played the Android version, initiated Brotherhood of Shadow. Um, I plan to have um, one more video in the next week or so where um, I need to test the easy... Pazak mod. I'm pretty sure it works, um, or I'm going to test that in the Jedi from the start mod. I can't test the swoop racing mod, the easy swoop racing mod until I get to um, Tatooine or Manan or one of the other worlds. Although theoretically, because I have the um, save game for um, Brotherhood of Shadows, I, it might theoretically work, so I might be able to test that as well. But I just want to make sure that those other mods work with the Brotherhood of Shadow mod installed. So I'm going to have one more gameplay video where I try to test those various other mods to some extent. But much like I played, much like I did earlier this year, I'm continuing to use Jedi from the start, Easy Pasak, and Easy Swoop Racing as mods to make the Kotor One gameplay that much better. Um, but that's for a twist, more, mostly for just 2024 planning. Um, I'm rounding out this year, just finishing up Doom and a couple of other side gameplays that I wanted to play just because, you know, Doom 1 and 2 I played. And I, I spent a lot of this year playing those various mods, playing Doom 3, get that off the bucket list and things like that. So, um, but look out, yeah, look out for that KOTOR gameplay for next year. The YouTube channel has my prior gameplay. So if you want to, Check out all the various different ways I've played the game in the past. Those are all available there. So that's all there is for this particular episode. To kind of summarize the end, Headphones Kneel Down Reviews has all the links for subscription, support, past episodes, social media links, and all of that good stuff. But thanks for tuning into this particular episode, and until next time.